Okay, here comes one. And looking straight on at the gauge, it's exactly 50. Let's go ahead over to number three now, which would be the next one on that bank. Okay, and again, looking straight on, it is exactly the same as before. Let's go on to number five. And number five, we are, if, if anything, it might be just a hair, just a hair higher in pressure, um, which of course would mean that if it's a hair higher in pressure, it had a little bit less fuel delivery. But the trouble is we're talking about well under half a PSI. I mean, just insignificant difference. And uh, that is not going to explain that much of a fuel trim. We may even go ahead and repeat this. Well, let me just go ahead and repeat that one um, later. I won't be able to do it right now without resetting the software, but I'll redo that one later. But it's, it's not gonna be an issue. Let's go ahead over to the last one on that bank now. Okay, here's the last one. And that one's dead on again. So one thing I you know, maybe don't particularly care too much about this, uh, is that it only drops a couple of PSI, um, but, but actually it's under the high pressure like that, that you would expect the greatest margin of error anyway, I suppose. But um, the other tool that I'm gonna show you uh, does this a little bit differently, but uh, the bottom line is, um, I think we're, we're gonna pass this test. Let me try one more time on number five though, just to see what happens here. Okay, I had to reset the software, but let's see what we get. And you know what, it is interesting, but um, it is just a hair, just a hair higher. Um, you know what, let's uh, go back to the dry erase board and make a note on this. All right. Okay, in all honesty, that it's not gonna be a, an injector balance thing, but um, one of the things is that on uh, number five, um, it was just, a hair different, I believe it is completely insignificant. What we're gonna do is keep that in mind. If we run down the list and don't find anything else, then I might be a little more inclined to believe there may be an issue that we need to pay attention to here. Now the question of course is, how would we validate that this is the problem? Well, what I would be tempted to do is swap this fuel injector over to the other bank. If I swap number five with number two, for example, and that lean condition moves to the other bank, we are done. It was a fuel injector number five imbalance. So we're, you know, and this happens a lot that things don't necessarily work out, but we're gonna go ahead and keep our eye on this as a possibility. And of course, the other possibility, if there was an electronic control, if I got that same, if we didn't move the problem, but I also got that other injector to give that same extraordinarily slight imbalance, extraordinarily slight, then I would think there's an electrical control issue um, where maybe we've got a little bit higher resistance or something, the pintle's not opening or I don't know, something like that. But it would be indicative that we may have some issue with this injector control. So um, anyway, those are our possibilities here. So we'll revisit that possibly later. Um, what I'm gonna do now is show you another way to do this test. And given the variability that we saw here, um, I think I may go ahead and just repeat this test on that entire bank anyway, using this different tool. Now, one weakness with that scan tool method is that not all vehicles work with the scan tool on that test. Not all, not all vehicles will have it available. And the other limitation with that is for people that don't have a scan tool. So what I'm gonna show you is this guy here. Um, and I saw this actually on Scanner Danner's channel and I decided to get one because I very often am doing uh, fuel injection tests on cars that are not compatible with my scan tool test like that. And this is just a electronic fuel injector tester. To be honest with you, I actually like this better than the scan tool except for the fact that the scan tool does also consider the PCM control and control wiring to the injector in its test. But what this does is it only directly tests the injector, but I actually think it does a little better job of it and you can set it under different settings as well where I cannot do that with the scan tool. So the way this works, it actually uses battery power 
and it's actually the exact same thing. Um, you hook up your fuel pressure gauge to your system, and what this does is we, hook, we unhook the fuel injector, hook this up to the injector, and then you will set your pulses on here, and I usually go for the 50 pulses at 10 millisecond, but either way, you can have one long pulse, you can have 50 smaller pulses, or 100 extremely tiny pulses, so you can test under sort of different load conditions would be sort of the equivalent there. And um, I generally go ahead and set it for the 50 pulses in the middle. And then if I have any kind of issue, I may look and reproduce it with the other settings. But this end right here, I'm just gonna go ahead and put directly onto the injector. One of the nice things about it is it's compatible with a, any GM injector that I've done this on. Um, if it's not, then you'll have to you know, rig up some kind of wiring mechanism. But let me go ahead and undo a control injector. All right, so now I'm plugged onto my control injector. Now, one other thing, you will, of course, have to manually prime the system by turning the key on and off. Okay, so we're back to prime, and then when I, when I press the button here, you see it gives a much more healthy delivery of fuel, which I think is a better way to assess. And we can look, and uh, if I look at it square on, it reads exactly 34 PSI. So every injector should read exactly 34 PSI. Let me go ahead and put this on one more control injector on bank two, just to verify our accuracy. And then we're just gonna repeat this test on bank one because we had that questionable injector. And now we have a second way to validate it. All right, I'm primed up on to injector number four. And looking dead on, we are right on the 34 PSI mark. So uh, we're good on our two control injectors. Let me go ahead and set it up on the other. Okay, we're primed up. Let's go ahead and do this on number one. And it reads, just a hair, just a hair below the 34, but looking on it dead on, I mean, it's, it's just extremely minor. Let's go ahead and do number three. All right, we should be primed up. And, uh, you know, well, admittedly, maybe if I had a professional gauge, I could get, you know, right to the half a PSI or something if I had a bigger gauge. But anything under a PSI, to be honest with you, I'm really not worried about. So let's go ahead and do this one. And that one reads, uh, interesting, 30, it reads just about 33 and a half. So it's, it's uh, just, just under 34. So it actually injected a little more fuel maybe than with the other test, I guess. But uh, again, we're looking at pretty insignificant variance here as far as I'm concerned. Let's move on to number five. All right, we're primed up here, and this one should be interesting. Let's see what we get. Dead on 34, absolutely dead on 34. So I am no longer worried about that, but to be scientific, we wanna go ahead and finish off on this bank and get number seven taken care of. Okay, and uh, typical with an LS1 engine, the further back under the cowl you get, the harder your clearance, but it did actually present a very real problem for putting the injector, the manual injector tester, onto number seven. And that is that injector number seven is located directly underneath the air injection reaction diverter valve. Now, of course, as you know, for me, removing the diverter valve is not the issue. Um, for other people, they're gonna be like, oh no, what do I do? The diverter valve's in the way. Um, well, dumbass, you remove the diverter valve so that you can access it. If you're smart enough to use fuel trims to diagnose you need to do a balance test, I'm going to hope that you would figure out how to remove a diverter valve that is in the way of plugging in an injector. The problem is that it is a scientific issue that I have with moving the diverter valve. You see, air injection reaction is one of our variables that we need to test. If I mess with that, and that was what the problem was all along, and then I put it back together again and fix it, then we would never have found what our issue is, and this would cause me to do some more testing on the 
balance test issue, which we don't have, by the way, but it's the only thing that we have any indication. So you see there is a scientific reason that I cannot test that final injector until we do the air leak diagnosis to validate there is no possibility the air injection reaction system. Only after I do that can I then remove it because I am no longer concerned about it being a variable. So that is the issue. You've always got to be thinking scientifically about this. I do not want to introduce a new variable into this because I'm just eager to finish a test. You have to be smart about it. So um, this leaves us with only one other possibility at this point, and that is to hold off. I'm going to make a note here also that we did not test number seven with the manual tester, but we're going to go on and move to our second possibility here, and that is going to be some type of increase in unmetered air on bank one under load. An exhaust leak is what everybody um, thought would be the most likely explanation for that. I agree. So what we are going to do to test for an exhaust leak is there's, there's different ways that we could do it. We could listen for one. We could feel for one. But I'm just going to go ahead and stab this thing right in the throat, and we're going to go ahead and do a smoke test for it. All right, so I've tested that we've got smoke coming out of the smoke machine. Now I've got a little challenge here in that I've got a dual exhaust thing here, so I'm going to have to plug in the other exhaust holes with some towels. So it'll take me a minute to do this and make sure that I seal up this exhaust system pretty good. Potato might work pretty good too, I guess. Okay, so let's get some smoke pumping through there. So let me hook up my light here for smoke detection and then uh, I'm gonna have to uh, do one thing though. Um, I've got one viewer and only one that criticized a procedure similar to this that I did in an earlier video where he says that you cannot use a smoke machine at the tailpipe because the smoke will not make it past the catalytic converter so it will never reach the front of the car. And the evidence for this is if you shine a flashlight through a catalytic converter the light will not exit the other side. The only reason I don't punch the guy in the throat is because technically while he has a incorrect logic for the reason, it, it is still a scientifically valid reason. We do, I suppose, if we see no smoke indicating an exhaust leak, is it because we don't have smoke at, at the front of the car for whatever reason? Certainly I'm not worried about it, won't make it past the, the catalytic converter, but did the smoke machine turn off? Did uh, the air compressor not give compression? Whatever. I don't know. So what I need to do is a positive control to verify that we are getting smoke smoke to the front of the car and if there is an exhaust leak that we will be able to detect it with the smoke machine. So what I cannot do is induce that on um, just bank one because that is a variable bank. So what I'm going to do is test that by just loosening up the EGR valve here and if we see smoke billowing out of it then obviously we're getting smoke to the banks up front here. So let me go ahead and do that real quick. All right, and now it should be very obvious from the smoke billowing out from that valve. Let's see if we can catch that on camera. It should show up pretty well. All right, that should show up pretty well there. So uh, that's just from under the EGR valve. So obviously you can easily get smoke to the front of the engine from an exhaust pipe with a smoke machine. So there you go. QED on that little discrepancy there. Let's move on and start seeing if we got an exhaust leak now. I am not seeing any smoke here and I actually have my machine on pretty much full blast so you, you might even be able to hear a little hissing in the background and that's actually from the pressure of the exhaust in the back uh, that's that's squeezing past those towels that I used to block. As a matter of fact, I kind of had to tie the inlet for the smoke into the exhaust because it kept wanting to pop out from the pressure. That alone is just indication that we don't have a leak, but I'm not seeing anything. A good idea is to kind of look above and just look for any evidence of shadows of the smoke or anything. You'll see it if it's there, but I don't see anything at all. I definitely love this smoke tester, definitely a very handy thing to have, but uh, let's see, if we look here where the light is, 
where the light is uh, shining right there in between the spark plug wire and the steering column. That's my Bank One Sensor 102 sensor. You'll notice that it's just right at the collector of the headers there. So really, I don't have to look too much beyond that. If there's going to be a leak, it's going to be pretty much at the exhaust manifold or maybe at that flange where it goes to my Y pipe. So I will get under the car and check that, but the smoke would move upwards and I certainly don't see any evidence of anything leaking. So the other thing I'm gonna check um, is of course my air injection reaction inlet, which is also a potential source for a leak. There is no leak there, nothing up to the check valve. Um, and I've traced the hose up to the diverter and there is no leak with the air injection system. I'm actually more confident about that than I am about the exhaust at that point because I still want to go under the vehicle. But we are going to be negative on, on an exhaust leak here. Let's go under the vehicle and verify. But uh, first I want to check that my smoke machine is still on. All right, so there's my cat. And since it's my cat, that would of course be Schrodinger's cat. And then let's look up at our flange here. We can see our O2 sensor one very clearly there. And there is no smoke whatsoever there. And nothing around the flange. Of course, I would be mostly worried ahead of the sensor or at the sensor itself. I am very confident this vehicle does not have any exhaust leaks, at least on bank one. Well, I was hoping I wouldn't have to change into dirty clothes and get under the car for this, but uh, it is pretty obvious we don't have an exhaust leak. However, I'm gonna show you another way that we can test this. And what I'm gonna do is bring up some um, oxygen sensor and fuel trim data on my scan tool. We're gonna go around that same area with a propane torch, uh, not lit, of course, but just the idea is that we'll richen the um, signal from the O2 sensor if propane enters the exhaust at any point. So let me go ahead and set that up. All right, and what I've got is my Bank One Sensor One up here, kind of expanded out to make it easy to see. Fuel trim on the bottom. Notice our fuel trim is uh, hovering right around zero as we expect. Um, let's just reproduce the problem real quick. Let me bring up uh, long-term fuel trim here. But yeah, you can see we, we jumped up on our long-term there. So we've already got a learn in process for the short-term at that particular load condition. So what I'm going to do is we really don't need that. It's a little bit redundant, but um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and just put some propane right into the intake just to verify that we get a response here. So we should go quite rich on the O2 and we do and we go very lean. I'm sorry, very um, negative on the fuel trim, um, um, giving a lean command. So let's pull that back out, make sure we return back and you see we're starting to stabilize again now. So let me go ahead and get that stabilized. And then if we see that same reaction, if I hit a spot where there is an exhaust leak, then of course that is gonna have the same effect on that oxygen sensor. And I'm trying to especially get around like the air injection, around the bolts, around the intake manifold, around the exhaust manifold bolts and it doesn't appear that I'm going to be able to uh, get, get it to go rich there. Let's try back here. I hate to go back under the car, but I'm going to actually go ahead and do that just to be safe. But we're putting a pretty good dose of propane around everything, and I'm not getting a rich command or a rich signal. All right, well, it's pretty obvious to me that we're pretty stable here no matter what I do. So I do not believe we are going to find. All right, well, I didn't see any reaction. Well, there, when I went up higher in RPM than at that cell, I think we, we got a little bit more of a trim increase, but uh, we are, yeah, we're definitely reproducing the problem, but we're certainly not finding an exhaust leak to be the cause of it. All right, I am going to definitively Eliminated an exhaust leak, air injection leak for sure, um, misfire. I guess I, I could have put some misfire counter up there, but um, th there's there's no misfires either. You can you would definitely be able to feel them and tell them, and there's no misfire. So I am pretty confident that we are going to be able to eliminate that. This is an unmetered air issue. Um, 
I'm pretty confident it's not an insufficient fuel delivery issue, but we still have a little bit of unfinished business there. But this, based on the things that we use to test them, we've certainly eliminated them. And I really can't think of other unmetered air on bank one only um, under load. An exhaust leak's really pretty much all I can think or a misfire. So I think we're done there. I'm ready to move on to number three now and look at the possibility that we're just getting inaccurate data from this oxygen sensor. So as long as I've got the scan tool plugged in, I think we're going to go ahead and repeat that earlier test and look at O2 responses on each bank and see that they are simultaneous and equivalent um, in their reaction to different variables that we will induce. So let's go ahead and start the car up, get the scan tool hooked up and see if we can find anything that might indicate an O2 sensor issue. All right, so what we've got is our in red O2 sensor bank one, sensor one, and in green O2 sensor bank two. Um, one of the things I've expanded out a little bit to make it easier to see any differences so uh, it looks like it's kind of reporting slow, but that's sort of intentional by me. On the bottom in red, long-term fuel trim bank one, and in green, long-term bank two. Let's just reproduce our problem, okay? And we go up to about 10 on the long-term fuel trim bank one. When driving the car, it does go over 20, so there's definitely a, a load difference. So what I wanna do now is let me go ahead and induce a rich condition by adding some propane. There's our rich on the O2 sensors. Looks like they both go pretty identical, doesn't it? We should start seeing those fuel trims changing. Now that's kind of interesting. Notice that if anything, bank one actually reacts first. Um, and that is a little concerning that bank two is not reacting. Uh, let me pull up some short term fuel trims because that's kind of weird. Okay, so there's our short-term fuel trims. Both of them are definitely negative, so um, not sure why we're not seeing a response from the long-term yet on bank two. But that is, um, I don't know, that's uh, kind of interesting and it kind of makes me wonder a little bit about that theory I had about the false normal that I all but eliminated. Um, but at least we're going short-term fuel trim negative on both, which is a good sign. Let's see what our reaction is when I take away the propane. Obviously the idle reacts. And now we get a little bit of a leaning out. <laughs> Engine doesn't seem to like that. Obviously we're going way lean now. All right. Um, Admittedly, that's, that's probably not the reaction that I would be expecting. Notice how we're still really low on the long term still on bank one. And I'm waiting for that to climb up and start going positive. There it goes. All right, so I let this go ahead and stable out a little bit. Let's uh, reaffirm we still have our condition and we do. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and do the opposite. Let's go ahead and induce a vacuum leak, see if we get some weird responses. So here goes a vacuum leak. And try not to kill the engine here, but let's see if we can get it. There's enough of one. And again, we get a much faster reaction here, at least from the fuel trim perspective on the long term. I'm not quite sure what to say about that. I'm really not, because this is at the um, vacuum brake booster. You see we're going way lean here. Okay, this is definitely interesting. This makes me really wonder. All right, I think I know what I wanna do now. All right, well that was uh, 
weird. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I've actually seen that before. And obviously with this being my car and all the experimenting I, I do to learn this stuff in the first place, I, I would be well aware if that was a normal reaction and I am telling you it is not. So based on that, I think we may be on to something here. And actually it is because of this one that I really just put in just to be sort of scientifically complete. So um, what we need to do now, based on that information, I want to go ahead and swap the bank one and bank two front sensors with each other's locations and see if we get this problem to move. If we get it to move, then um, though all, that, would, that would necessitate it is for some reason the O2 sensors, even though the O2 sensors do seem to be working. Uh, what I'm concerned about is the fact that the O2 sensors seem to work, the short-term fuel trim seem to work, but that bank two long-term fuel trim seems to be really stubborn to adjust for whatever reason, and I'm hoping for some reason it has to do with the O2 sensor, but um, that would be an interesting one that I'll have to think about. So let's go ahead and swap these sensors. And if the problem moves, I believe that's gonna be a good day because that definitively would fix it and show that the bank two does respond accordingly. All right, I am always cognizant that I may be getting viewers from other channels or chat rooms or whatever. So, uh, and they are looking at this stuff with diagnosis and thinking about explanations of problems. And they're saying to themselves, my God, man, what sorcery is this? Well, I got something for you guys here. I will show you how to remove an oxygen sensor. Well, there it is. I'll never understand it, but show a video on how to change one of these and you will get a quarter million subscribers and hundreds of thousands of views. But show a person how they know they need to change this and you won't even be on the top 100 channels on YouTube Automotive. Go figure. All right, got the oxygen sensors switched. It always amuses me when we get people from the other channels or chat rooms on here and they watch a video like this and their comment is, oh, a good tip is to put anti-seize on the oxygen sensors before you install them. Really? Hey, thanks, bro. All right, we'll get set up here. I was trying to be as fast as I could to keep the engine warmed up while changing those sensors as this uh, nice blister on my knuckle will attest to. So um, let's see if it's worth my while. <laughs> 